In today's episode, we'll be discussing the secret engagement of Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill in Emma. So we're going to be looking at what signs and clues come up before the, uh, the engagement is announced by Frank, um, kind of close to the end of the novel. Um, because I think this is just interesting. Like, obviously, um, myself and a lot of people listening, we've read these books quite a few times now. And so um, we already know all the spoilers, like we already know what's going to happen. So it's just interesting to go back and see, you know, were there clues earlier on that they were engaged? Where are they? And um, yeah, we thought that would be a fun topic. So hi, Alice. It's so good to have you back with me. Um, you were the first ever person on my podcast. So I always love having you back on because it's just like, you know, memories. <laughs> I know it's I know thank you hello yeah it's so exciting to be back and I always get so excited for these so but yeah thank you for asking me back again it's such an honour um yeah I've been really enjoying all the podcast episodes that have obviously come since our first one so it's really exciting to be here what like a couple of years later um I feel it's literally been yeah so, yeah, it's been like yeah. two years, isn't it? nearly two years, I think. No, it's mad, isn't it? Mad. But yeah, really, uh, really excited to be here and really excited to chat about this topic as well. Yeah, absolutely. And total credit to you for this uh, topic, because it was on one of your rereads that you were like, oh, we've got to talk about this, you know, the signs of their engagement that happen before it's announced. Um, so yeah, like you were, you were rereading and you kind of said to me about this, which I was like, that's such a great topic. We definitely need to do that. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. So I think it was last year I reread Emma. So I usually kind of pick a couple of Austin novels to reread again over the year. And last year it was Emma's turn. Um, and I was reading through it. And I think for some reason this time, the story of Frank and Jane just really, really jumped out at me. And I just found myself in this reread completely kind of focusing on their story. And I just find it super interesting and fascinating and I was like right I know exactly what I need to discuss this with I need to discuss it with Izzy um, <laughs> so no, you very kindly said yes let's have a let's have a chat about it and yeah appreciate that because I'm just going to use this to splurge all our ideas backwards and forwards so um and I hope it will be interesting for yeah your listeners as well yeah, absolutely. And I think Emma's a novel that's just full of such big characters like big personalities um that I think sometimes it's easy, it's easy to kind of breeze past the whole Frank and Jane situation, like what's going on for them privately, um, because we are exposed to little bits of it, which we're, obviously we're going to talk about today, but it's easy to kind of glaze over them a little bit because there's so many other big characters who, you know, have yeah. so much going on. So, and other relationships that kind of appear more significant because this one's so secretive. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to kind of chat about it. Yeah, definitely. I 100% agree with that because I think like with you know the Austin novels all of them have got that kind of big pairing that coupling that we're all kind of rooting for you know like Darcy and Elizabeth in this case it's Knightley and, and Emma and that's kind of the story that we're all kind of looking for and rooting for and we kind of brush everything else aside because we're like you know we need to make sure that uh, Mr Knightley and Emma get together so things like this kind of are yeah underneath the surface a little bit and I actually think Emma is honestly is one of the best books written to be honest like obviously i'll always stand by pride and prejudice and what have you but i think emery is amazing and it is a real study in in people like you say but kind of in a really really clever way and i was saying to you earlier like the fact that you know this whole narrative is going on underneath it is almost like i described it to you as like a mystery novel didn't i where we're kind of trying to pick up clues and things like that and i know a few people have also described it as that before it really reminds me of like a Agatha Christie novel or something like that because it deals with like that classic scenario of sort of English village life. So, you know, you've got like observations going on, rumours, like the roles of people in the village. You've got like the stereotypes of the kind of people in in the village as well. And everyone sort of has their place in, you know, in the society. Everyone's got their place. You know, you've got Emma up at the big house and you know, you've got the Bates. It's down in the town that everyone calls on and um but yet there's kind of stuff bubbling beneath the surface and in this case you know one of those things is frank and emma and actually, no sorry frank and jane and it's actually really interesting how their story also kind of we is weaving together everyone else's at the same time so everything's kind of connected to everyone like you know classic living in the country in england i think your business is everyone's business so yeah. <laughs> that hasn't changed certainly um, but yeah, that's how kind of I, I started to, to view it, which was pretty yeah, interesting to start to think about as I reread it last year. 
Yeah, I really love what you're saying there as well. It's, it's this this idea that they're so close knit and that is the perfect setting for any like mystery novel. It's like either all set in a yeah. house or all set on a train or it's all set in somewhere that's like so tight yes. um, so that there can be so many layers and you're not getting distracted. Like Pride and Prejudice is so yes. different that it spans across like so much of the UK because um, they're traveling all the time. Whereas with Emma, it's like you're just kind of in this very small town. And so, um, yeah. Austin, that's, obviously, yeah, is exactly fantastic right. at creating these layers. Yeah, I, I literally made a note of that as well. The fact that, you know, she's very good at kind of, she usually sort of takes either uh, maybe just one family or like you say, actually travels around the country. But here we've got a whole cast of characters in a village. Yeah, very much like kind of the... Um, like a Cluedo board. <laughs> like, yeah, like an Agatha Christie novel. I was like reading the, the murder of Roger Ackroyd again the other, um, the other week. And actually it's a similar sort of setup where you've got these sort of these villages of people and yet all their business kind of intertwines in each other's business and obviously there's, there's no murder in this book so it's fine <laughs> but, um, but it is just interesting that style of writing is something that's obviously appealed to a lot of people for a very long time and even though this isn't like a murder mystery book the, that kind of yeah setup is something that has kind of continued for yeah, g- generations really Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think Jane and Frank are really interesting characters in the sense that they've both left Highbury. So everybody else is being kind of there forever. They've grown up. They're like Emma, you know, they don't never leave. And they're kind of like these outsiders who come back, like they return to their, you know, place of origin. Um, and they've explored things, they've experienced things outside of the town. And, um, that's very different than a lot of the other characters. And so when they come back, there's just like so much speculation and, um, they both have like quite um, turbulent upbringings where they they kind of live with other people, whether that's because they're orphaned like Jane is, um, or, you know, Frank's mum dies and Mr. Weston can't keep him. So he goes and lives with the Churchills and, you know, they've, they've kind of had very complicated lives compared to somebody like Emma. And so then they come back in, um, there's all this secrecy and um, speculation about what's been going on. And um, something that I love that I noticed is even before either of them come back, Mr. Weston's talking about Frank and the fact that he never returns to Highbury. Well, he's saying like, he will come soon. And everyone else is like, yeah, we've been saying that for like his whole <laughs> life. Um, but he makes this quote where it says, there are secrets in all families, you know? And I think, oh my gosh, isn't that such massive foreshadowing for the whole of Frank's story um, from that point on? I love that. That is actually such a good quote. Yeah, it is. It kind of sets the whole the whole scene doesn't it and as you say they've kind of gone off and and done stuff and they've come back to Highbury where everyone else has kind of been living the same life for years and years and so to them having Frank there and Jane there actually brings a bit of excitement to them as well and it will start to stir this this tranquil pot that's just been kind of yeah sitting there for for years and I think yeah I love that quote you just brought up actually and I think also someone else who's very good at kind of or telling what's going to happen is Mr. Knightley as well. So he, during this kind of period in the book where there is a lot of focus on Jane and, and Frank, there's not too much of Mr. Knightley in the narrative. But when he does come up, he's like, he's got some good, some good insights and some good observations into what is happening. And he kind of mentions when they're talking about Frank and why he's not coming. And he very much kind of says, you know, it's you know there's reasons why he's not visited we kind of feel from nightly that he he thinks that there's something suspicious going on with his character and you know he's not altogether true he kind of says and um nightly calls him weak he also says you know we we hear of him forever at some watering place or another um, a little while ago he was at weymouth massive clue there also this you know this proves he can leave the churchill so all these kind of little discussions that are going on starts to sort of sit in our minds but what is really important though is that actually a lot of this is told from Emma's perspective. I think that's something that also throughout this period as well is a theme that is continually running. There's a lot of the reactions we get to what is happening and kind of the situation is from Emma's perspective. And it's really clever because although Jane Austen doesn't use the kind of, you know, I said this or Emma thought this, she's still doing it kind of in the third person, but it is still very much as if Emma's telling the story even though she actually isn't it's really clever I think yeah that's what you have to take into account too but that's just a kind of theme that goes throughout the this whole section of the book in particular 
No, I think that's a great point. I think um, Austin's very clever at making her narrative voices blend with yes. the characters. Like you see that a lot in North Anger with Henry Tilney. I think you see it in Emma with both Emma and Mr. Knightley at times. Um, she's very skilled at that. It's it's really it's a really good way to show without being like because you don't then get caught up and you're like oh this is a obviously a bias perspective because it's all coming from emma because she does it in this kind of third person it comes through the narrative you kind of get sucked into the story as well and you don't question things as much you kind of yeah. get you you get drawn yeah. into into what emma's that's, thinking or what mr Knightley's yeah, thinking and good way of putting it. i literally put like several times you get kind of sucked into emma's perspective of it in the kind of her her feelings on stuff, yeah so. We do get, I think, definitely on why that's why it's interesting to reread these novels because obviously maybe the first time round, maybe we have got sucked into sort of Emma's way of thinking. But when you kind of stand back a little bit because you know what happens, you can sort of start to think about the other characters and their perspectives as well. So that's really true. Yeah. So something that you mentioned just before and um, something that comes up multiple times within Emma is this topic of Weymouth. Um, so it comes up a lot and a lot of clues to Jane and Frank's engagement can be found in the exchanges about Weymouth. So um, there's one that's pretty, well, basically the, the Austin talks about them being there separately. So we accept that they both been at Weymouth at individual times. She doesn't explicitly say it, but we hear it from people like Mr. Knightley that he was once at Weymouth, or we hear that um, Jane has an encounter with Mr. Dixon at Weymouth. And then uh, when Emma meets Jane, she confirms that they were there at the same time. So it says um, in the book, she referring to Jane Fairfax and Mr. Churchill had been at Weymouth at the same time. It was known that they were a little acquainted, but not a syllable of real information could Emma procure. Um, and so Jane's not giving up any details here. Like when, when Emma's like grilling her, like what happened at Weymouth? What's Miss, what's Frank Churchill like? And, and Jane's just there, like, obviously the running theme of Jane is that she's super reserved and she doesn't say anything. And Emma's like, what, why are you not even just like, it's weird that you're not actually saying anything, but, um, I love yeah. that it's actually early on that it's confirmed that they've they've been in this place together and there's this whole notion of like what happens in weymouth stays yes, in weymouth exactly. nobody <laughs> talks about it <laughs> don't go to weymouth guys <laughs> no, no, <we're> <laughs> um yeah that's so true so yeah before like we've got this kind of section at the start of their sort of story as it were which actually kind of starts around halfway through the book but it's where like, jane austen just kind of she sets the scene so you've got kind of jane um, arriving and then you've got Frank who arrives just slightly later and you've got this bit like you said these exchanges between Emma and Jane Fairfax where they're she's trying to fish for information and it is very early on established that they were in Weymouth together as you say um so she was I think as you said an orphan so she was staying with some friends I think they were her father's friends her father died and his friend took her on into the family um, yeah, they were so both she, in the army together, yeah, I believe. So, yeah, yeah. like that. Colonel they, Campbell like, owes them a debt or something. Yeah, <laughs> classic, you know. <laughs> um, so they had gone off to Ireland, I think, to see friends or family because um, the daughter has recently married Mr. Dixon, who was there as well. So you've kind of got this family. Uh, you've got Mr. Dixon and you've got Jane Fairfax. They've gone off to Weymouth. Um, they have now gone to Ireland and she decided to actually go visit her family back in Highbury who were the Bateses um but we kind of get this so we get lots of letters sent from Jane to, to Miss Bates who um who loves to read them out and there's I found this line in one of them so where she talks about you know why is Jane coming to Highbury now as well because that's also kind of interesting too and um and she says you know with regard to her not accompanying them to Ireland her account to her aunt contained nothing but truth so there might be some truths not told and that was like a massive indicator as well so she's obviously hold, you know she's holding something back and you know emma kind of describes this attitude like you say is very reserved and she keeps fishing for information about frank and things like that um and there's this line at the end of i think it's chapter 20 and the line it kind of finishes the chapter off and it just goes emma could not forgive her and then you go on to chapter 21 and that starts again. Emma could not forgive her because she's just like this thing of the fact that she's not giving her any information is such a big deal to Emma. And um, again, we're seeing it from her perspective, but it really kind of cements this idea that, um, you know, she can't forgive her for the fact that she's not letting on any information about what Frank was like because she met him there um, and nothing's been said. So 
at this point I don't understand to be fair why alarm bells weren't ringing more obviously for everyone but I feel like before it never really occurred to me when I first read it until kind of rereading it a few times after but <laughs> yeah I feel like when you actually read it and you read it with this viewpoint where you're looking for the clues then you're like yeah. oh my gosh it's so obvious like there's a point where Emma says you know there was probably something more to conceal than her own preference like she's like there's probably Jane's probably hiding more than the fact that she just doesn't want to tell me something but nobody digs any deeper they're just yeah. like this is clearly fishy but that's okay yeah, like, yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's just like a running a yeah. running issue where everyone's just I accepting. mean this is quote here where it says she and Mr Frank Churchill had been at Weymouth at the same time it was known that they were a little acquainted but not a syllable of real information was you know, given. And it's like, that is so obvious that something has obviously gone on. Why wouldn't you just give anything? No, exactly, exactly. Um, in obviously, there's another clue that I w figured out like later on is um, in one of the letters, um, Mrs. Bates says that um, Jane caught a bad cold, poor thing, yes. so long ago as the 7th of November and has never been well since. A long time, is it not, for a cold to hang upon her? Yes, Mrs. Bates, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, Miss Bates, that is a long time. And it actually turns out later that they got engaged in October. And so obviously by November, Jane's like, wearied she's just like <laughs> she's like nothing's going on nothing's happening here there's no movement and then this like this theme of her being sick just continues out throughout the whole novel um like miss bates talks about how she never eats anything and you know i feel like there is like a, a romantic side of that you know where you can't eat or sleep because you're so in love with somebody but it like passes over to like a toxicity where it's like you know she's it, she's living in such uncertainty yeah, which we'll obviously explore as we get on because it does kind of build and build and build this tension between what is happening. And yeah, but like I say, that was yeah a, a massive indicator as well, like in, in the letter where she talks about her being her being ill um, from the 7th of November. And you're like, yeah, hmm, I wonder why, what happened around that time? Um, but yeah, that, that's, such a, that's such a good indicator too. And then, so you've got this dialogue, this kind of narrative as well between Emma and Jane, just fishing for stuff. Um, and then... I think literally a couple of chapters later, Mr. Weston then receives the letter from Frank Churchill to say he's he's going to come and visit. And it's ridiculous because that is literally only a couple of chapters after Jane Fairfax arrives, I realised. And we've literally we've been waiting as well the whole book for him to arrive. And everyone keeps saying it's like, oh, suddenly um, everyone comes at once. You know what I mean? And it's like, hmm, that's a bit of a bit of a coincidence and with that one again like all the narrative was focused on Emma's reaction to that as well so we, again it kind of misleads our thoughts so you know Emma's spirits are quite mounted up to happiness and you can see from the start as well that Mr Weston is sort of trying to make a bit of a match between Frank and Emma so that idea is also planted in the reader's head as well so you're kind of having to deal with this um so it shifts the attention off this um idea of sort of Jane Fairfax and why are they turning up at the same time but do you know I also noticed that it kind of confirms what Mr Knightley said that Frank only ever goes somewhere if there's you know uh, there's enough motive to do so and isn't it interesting that he only arrives in Highbury once Jane's there um yeah. and I think obviously Mr Knightley's very he's just very good at knowing people very and he knows Frank yeah. before knowing him <laughs> So basically, they come to Hartfield, but then there's this bit where um, Frank kind of brings up, like, I think it's the Bateses, and he kind of <laughs> pretends not to know their name, and he's like, oh, is it... Is it Barnes, is it, or is yeah, it Bates? Is it Barnes, <laughs> is it Who is it? I don't know. Um, and then he says, oh, well, I kind of, yeah, knew... Obviously, Jane Fairfax, whatever, in, in Weymouth. And he says, oh, you know, are they, in, are they in town? Maybe I should go call on them. But he refuses to be, like, they're like, oh, we'll escorted. Take, take there. But he refuses to be escorted or directed by anyone sort of other than his father at this point. And then Emma says to him, you know, like, oh, she's really very elegant and what have you. Kind of, like, did you think of her? Trying to, again, fish for information. And he sort of responds and just goes... He agreed to it, but with so quiet a yes, as inclined her almost to doubt his real concurrence. And um, that's sort of her perception of it. But obviously at this point, he's probably starting to think about what kind of line is he going to take now throughout the whole visit. The situation when um, Frank declines to let Mr Woodhouse's servant kind of take him to, yeah. to there. The reason he wants his father to take him is because his father's got business at the Crown. And so... 
it's kind of clear well it's not clear but it's clear when you look into it that he wants to go to the bases on his own he doesn't want anybody like being there and you know listening to the conversation it's really interesting that that is um, kind of his his motive is that he wants to kind of be there on the road. And I, I really like what you said about the fact that Emma tries to fish for information. She's like, what do you think of Jane Fairfax, basically? And he's just really weird about it. And he's just like, yes. But I love what you said, that he's trying to think about his line of narrative. And I was like, how, how am I going to approach this without making it obvious that I've got something going on? And I feel like he really leans on Emma, like whatever Emma suspects he leans on that so like we see that later on with the dixon situation and he just kind of feels for what she's going for and and just kind of follows along with what she's thinking that's such a good point because yeah i think he really does he kind of takes advantage of that doesn't he and that is it does become then really harsh to kind of everyone involved including emma as well and i think yeah that's so important so as soon as he kind of gets a feel for what emma's yeah thoughts are on Jane Fairfax and everything else, he can really use that to his advantage, which he does, and that is a recurring theme throughout, which is yeah, such a good point as well. Um, so yeah, he already, his priority has, has been to go down into Highbury and to find her. And as you say, looking back, that is so obvious and it's so cleverly done, how it's just kind of woven into the narrative quite carefully, because again, it's still all from Emma's perspective in a way, and really clever as well. Like, I like that point, what you said about, obviously, He's made sure he can go down and visit them on his own. You know, his father's got business at the Crown, so I'm just going to go and nip across and, <laughs> and see what else to say without anyone knowing. Um, but yeah, that's such a good point. And this kind of continues, like, this idea of wanting to be able to spend time with Jane, but how does he do it? So when they go into town again and he's kind of discussing, he's asking about the Crown and... Um, you know, asking, do, do you have balls there and what have you? And I think that's actually such an important point because a ball then was probably one of the only sort of socially acceptable ways of young people being able to kind of hang out like, and talk to each other without it being spoken about. So it would have been a great way to sort of socialise and see Jane Fairfax, you know, or, or prove that he has nothing to do with them, be able to kind of show that he can socialise with other people as well. So he can do both so he can kind of spend some time with her without drawing too much attention because you know it's it's a given that you'd you'd want to do that at a ball or kind of show and give attention to, to other ladies at the time and like he does use Emma in that way later on which we'll see so that again is already a plan that he's starting to hatch in his head you know the perfect place to to, to mingle with everyone and spend some time with Jane Fairfax without it being obvious. I love that. You know, I didn't, I mean, I did think like, obviously he's trying to find ways that everybody can come together, but that's so interesting. And obviously a ball's so intimate as well. Like it's a reason yeah. to touch other people. And <laughs> it sounds a bit yeah. weird. It's a reason to, to be physical without and, being yeah, inappropriate. Yeah, you, you, yeah, hold someone's hand, be close to them, have a private conversation when you're dancing or even just like stood in a corner somewhere, you know, like it is such, like say, a good way of actually being intimate without it being socially unacceptable. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that's such a great point that you that you brought that up. Um, there's a really weird moment where obviously Frank goes away um, for a day to have his hair cut yes. in London, and everybody's a bit like, "That's a little bit strange," but people are just people just let him off for anything. So they're like, "That's okay. He just wants a fancy haircut." And um, actually, having your hair cut in London apparently was kind of a thing back then. It was something that people did because it was like a luxury. Um, but if you get to talk about this, because he's not really having his hair cut, or at least it's not the only thing that he's doing in London. Yeah, so this is actually, yeah, like you say, at first glance, it is a bit weird, but everyone lets him, like, get away with it, like you say, because I think he's just kind of the hero of Highbury at this point, and everyone's there like, oh, we'll just entertain his his whims and his, <laughs> his need to be a lot more fashionable than ours, basically. Um, so you've got this this section where... Um, the day before he's been hanging out with Emma and they went shopping. I think there's a really important bit in here because they have a conversation when they're in the shop about Jane Fairfax's playing of the piano. He starts to ask her about, you know, what do you think of, um, you know, what do you think of her playing? And um, she kind of, they kind of again discuss this reserve 
and he's actually really harsh and he's there you know like oh and then her reserve i could never attach myself to anyone so completely reserved it is the most repulsive quality indeed one cannot love a reserved person um there is safety in reserve but no attraction it's so harsh <laughs> i know like, they're all, he's caused her to be reserved yeah. honestly yeah <laughs> and um so and he'd also blatantly avoided a question from emma so she kind of said you know how did you find her in weymouth and he completely ignores her and just goes oh isn't this the shop where everyone talks about let's go in and they sort of go into the shop so he's got time to sort of compose his thoughts so yeah then he starts stirring up this stuff about um you know gossip about mr dixon wanting jane to play piano um, more than he wants oh, to yeah. find to play piano and he'd always want jane fairfax to play instead of his own wife and this encourages emma to talk about her feelings regarding jane which are quite negative so you've got this whole conversation which frank churchill has cleverly directed um, the next morning, Frank goes to London to have his hair cut. Um, we know now that, you know, what he was probably doing at this point. And he was organising, which we'll find out in a moment, a piano to be delivered to Jane Fairfax. At this point, no one knows that this is what's happening. And when it actually happens again, no one knows. So we're kind of, again, this, this is a spoiler. Um, but based on yesterday's conversation, you suddenly realise how deliberate the timing is because he has had this conversation with Emma. He knows as well that Emma has got so much influence over everyone and the way she thinks. And that's also why he probably has these conversations with her. The timing is deliberate. He goes to London, has his hair cut, but instead he's ordering a piano um, to be sent to Jane Fairfax. So Which he can hide under cool. this notion that it's Mr. Yeah, Dixon sends it because Mr. Dixon likes to hear Jane yeah. play. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even though Mr. Dixon's yeah. off an island. Basically, yes. Yeah. So he's he's using them for his advantage, and um, yeah. So he's gone to do that. He returns, and then suddenly this piano arrives, and it's all everyone's talking about. But there's no name attached to it. So, you know, Emma's immediately kind of after that conversation, all she's thinking about is kind of Mr. Dixon and things like that. I think they passed off at the time as Colonel Campbell, who actually. Um, ordered it because as, as a present but anyway that for happened. jane yeah and you then it's um oh sorry just on that just on that point i think um it's interesting because everybody's everyone accepts that it's a gift of love but they can't work out whether or not it's like this kind of like paternal love or if it's um yeah. romantic love and mr natalie's kind of a little bit more hot on it and he's like yeah. it's really impractical this is a gift of somebody who's immature <laughs> i think he actually calls it a boyish scheme he's like this is not a practical gift that I, they, I don't think he can imagine Colonel Campbell sending something like this because, I mean, they live in a tiny, literally live in like a two bedroom it's flat so or something. It's tiny. And obviously he's like, well, whoever sent this has got no, it's just immature and it's just got no good judgment. That it's a bit daft. Which it exactly has. Because then, so after this, you have this party at a family called the Coles and they've invited sort of everyone in, in the village to it. And this is where it's then discussed. So you've got kind of, you can imagine this sort of drawing room party and everyone's kind of whispering and talking to each other about it and conversations are overheard. And um, we hear that Emma kind of overhears for the first time about the piano, the surprise that's arrived at the Bateses and they thought it'd been come from the campus. And after this conversation, we realised that Frank was actually standing near Emma. She kind of looks and turns to him and she goes, you know, why do you smile, said she. And he's obviously just stood there, like, taking this all in, just being like, this is absolutely hilarious. I'm the funniest person in the world. And, yeah, it is actually quite self... I don't know, it's weird because Jane Fair, like, she loves to play piano. So on one hand, you know, he's done it because he, he's done it for her in that respect. But also the way he's gone about it is really cruel as well because it's going to get talked about. Everyone talks about each other's business in the Highbury. And as you say, it was completely impractical. And so... He's, it's coming from quite a selfish place as well. I think that's probably a perfect way to explain Frank in this situation. He he almost shoehorns Jane into being so reserved and secretive about everything, but then he always drops these little hints or these or he he kind of teases people about them realizing, like in the town, and um, causes like more speculation on what's going on and i think he gets a real rise out of it and i think the yeah. piano forty is a really good example of that like he finds it funny that everybody doesn't know the secret and yeah. yet the secret's so important to him it's something that he's asked for it's you almost, know I don't... 
it's almost like not benefiting Jane. No, it's not. And he's almost doing it to sort of rebel against the system, if that makes sense. He's kind of getting such a kick out of the fact that he's being able to do something which doesn't fall in line with how you're supposed to act. And I don't know, maybe it does kind of revert back to the way that he's been brought up and he's completely rebelled in obviously his choice of, of wife and the way he's gone about it. And I think he's finding the whole thing hilarious. And he says at one point, like you say, it kind of comes across as this gift of love. And Frank actually says to Emma, he goes, uh, they sort of say, well, he goes off her again, encourages her to talk about it. It's actually Emma that says, oh, it's a gift of Mr. Dixon. And then he's still like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I now can see it in no other light than as an offering of love. Um, and the narrator kind of goes, there seemed no occasion to press the matter further. The conviction seemed real. He looked as if he felt it. And that's because he actually is being truthful in a way. It is an offering <laughs> of his love. And, you know, he makes it kind of really obvious that he's saying this to Emma. So he's being truthful. You know, it's a complete act of love because it's come from him, but he's twisted it so much. And it's just, yeah. And I think this whole the whole idea that Emma gets caught up, that she's like, there's obviously more to this. There's obviously some sort of love scheme going on. I know Emma's a bit obsessed with like matchmaking, but she isn't wrong. Like her direction's wrong because she thinks yes. it's Mr. Dixon, which is encouraged by Frank. But she knows there's some sort of romantic situation going on here because of all these hints. And Frank just plays on the fact that Emma thinks it's Mr. Dixon and he just eggs it up. But... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's just all about that. He's like, yeah, I just want to know. And obviously, yeah. loads of people think it's Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley's like, I wouldn't yes, give such a stupid yes, gift. This is, like, yes, <laughs> this is the point as well where this idea of Jane Fairfax and Mr. Knightley comes into play. I think Mrs. Weston mentions it to Emma as well. It's kind of like a matchmaking scheme. And Emma's like, no, not at all. This is where you sort of start to get a feel for Emma's own story with Mr. Knightley because she kind of gets a bit worried by this. We realise it's probably because she actually doesn't want anyone else to help him but that's yeah separate from that but yeah we kind of get this other seed planted in our head with Knightley and Jane Fairfax so again to misdirect the reader and to misdirect Emma um, in a sense we kind of are Emma as the reader because we're the ones being directed by what's happening um, no so, exactly yeah. and then you've got this conversation the next morning after this party and Emma bumps into Miss Weston and Frank Churchill and this kind of interesting exchange happens where Mrs. Weston sort of goes, you know, my companion tells me that I absolutely promised Miss Bates last night I would come this morning. And um, this was like Frank obviously saying, oh, yeah, you promised to go visit them. And um, he kind of makes out like, oh, I, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And then Mrs. Weston is like, oh, but you promised you'd accompany me. And he's like, oh, fine, I'll come with you. Like, as if that wasn't like, like it was your idea. Yeah, <laughs> this isn't on me. <laughs> yeah and then they go and i think what happens is oh yeah he then sends mrs weston out to go get emma because um yes he leaves them alone again alone. he's supposed yeah. to be fixing um you know the, the spectacle mrs bates's bates. Bates. glasses yeah, yeah they're and broken so mrs weston runs out to get emma and leaves obviously them alone other than this elderly lady who's there um, they then return, and on their return, Mrs. Bates is asleep, and Frank has not finished fixing the spectacles. The glasses, Someone yeah. pulls him up on this because they're like, it should have taken me two Yeah, Miss Bates is like, why is it taking so long? <laughs> <laughs> so again, another opportunity to be alone. And then, but then he teases Jane about the piano and says something about, oh, how lovely it is to hear this tune that made one happy. If I mistake not, that was danced at Weymouth. And she goes like bright red and starts playing something else. Emma obviously thinks that he's teasing her because it might be a song that her and Mr. Mr. Dixon, Dixon. do. But I think obviously what he's saying there is, you know, that was a song that they danced to, which is really lovely, but also again, just so uncalled for in front of everyone. Yeah, and he, he purposely tries to make her feel uncomfortable at times. I don't know why he does it. It's, it's very bizarre to you, me. But I think there's a really interesting thing when they walk into the room as well. I think the narrative states that her, um, him and Jane were sat like quite close together. Um, so it's like really interesting. It's, it's like these small moments where they are being intimate and everybody just brushes it aside and they just take it as normal. Um, and I think, again, like you said, because we see things from Emma's perspective, because Emma's not a massive fan of Jane, I don't think she would ever so match Jane with anybody at all, if that makes sense. There's going to be nobody that Jane, she's going to match Jane with. She wouldn't want to with Knightley, but she wouldn't want to with her with anyone. That's such a good point. Because she only matches people that she likes. 
Yeah. Uh, because we see it from Emma's perspective, we never really get this idea that Jane Fairfax should be matched with anyone because she's not going to think that or want to do that. So that's really interesting. Basically, we we move on a little bit further now and um, Frank does another one of his disappearing acts, um, usually because he's called back by Mrs. Churchill, who, and there's actually a quote later on that I'll just bring up now just because I think it's important, <laughs> is Emma makes this point that she says that um, the contrast between Mrs. Churchill's importance in the world and Jane Fairfax has struck her. One was everything and the other nothing. And I think this is a perfect example of when that is the case. Obviously, we know that Jane is engaged to Frank, and yet it's Mrs. Churchill that is Frank's total priority all the time. Like, it doesn't matter about Jane. That's why it's a secret in the first place. And so he leaves Highbury again to go to Mrs. Churchill, who's sick for the, um, the thousand time. Um, yeah. so <laughs> Yeah, so um, this happens and it puts kind of all of their plans on hold about a ball and everything. Yeah, so there'd been this idea of the ball and that's such an important point as well because you've got to remember whilst all this is going on, obviously that whole thing of, you know, Mr Churchill is in his head the whole time, which again, I think doesn't help the whole situation. Um, you know, that's why he's having to have this secret engagement in the first place. So it's all very kind of messed up in that respect. But he's had to leave so they have the idea of the ball they kind of set a date but it's had to be postponed because he had to leave to go back um yeah to his adopted family um and there's this weird strange goodbye as well he gives to emma before he goes um where he sort of feels like he's on the edge of about to say something she takes yes. it as him wanting to say I'm he's in love with her <laughs> Which, again, kind of, yeah, has taken a whole different direction to what he's actually trying to say. And I feel like he was actually sort of on the cusp of wanting to tell her and come clean about him and Jane. The Fairfax. Jane situation. Yeah, yeah so... he actually confirms that later on in the letter to um, yes, he does. Mrs. Weston. He says, like, I actually nearly told Emma, like, before I left that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we do realise that that's what was going on there um, initially. So in that that moment when he's speaking to Emma about it, there's a really awkward moment where Emma's like, oh, you're not going to have time to see any of your friends like the Bates is. And he's like, oh, I've already been there already. And then he checks himself because he's like, oh, gosh, that sounds weird. He's like, oh, I just thought it was the right thing to do. And it's like, OK. Nice. And Emma's like, that's a bit strange. Like you made the effort to go to yes. see the Bates is, but you're in a rush. Like that's a bit strange. That's such that's such a good point. Yeah, it, it's really funny. And um, when the kind of whole idea of the ball is suggested to before he leaves, we get this weird line from Jane Fairfax as well, where she suddenly becomes really excited and not reserved. And she's kind of like, oh, Miss Woodhouse, I hope nothing happens to prevent the ball. What a disappointment it would be. I do look forward to it. I own with great pleasure. And it's like, my word, you've not said like more than two, two words strung together. And yeah, so it's, it's, and then you have obviously got this delay where he has to go back. So um, again, you can understand where Jane does start to get a bit tired of everything. It's just probably the start of one of many things that happen. But yeah, it is, it is really interesting that whole bit before the delay is there's lots of stuff that goes into it the weird goodbye and jane being really excited about the ball so yeah um, absolutely yeah, he, he leaves and then you have the eltons return from their wedding <laughs> um i mean to be fair they would be just great to talk about on a different podcast anyway, cause... yeah so on the point of the eltons um arriving uh, Mrs. Elton becomes a bit of a dilemma for Jane because she's very adamant about getting her a position as a governess or just any position because she's like, a woman in your position, Jane, you need to, you know, have your life sorted out. Um, and Jane says, I am very serious in not wanting anything to be attempted for me at the present. Um, and she's, she's really clear about this all the way through. And everybody can see it, but Mrs. Elton, who keeps kind of forcing Jane to try and sort something out, um, and I think maybe in general, that's a little bit odd to us all because Jane is in a position where she needs to find out what her next step's going to be. There isn't any, obviously there isn't any clear sign that she's <sighs> attached to anybody. And even if she was attached to Mr. Dixon, he's already married, so that's not an option. Um, so obviously being a governess is what most people think her next step is going to be. And yet she's so against Mrs. Elton finding her employment is a little bit fishy. Yeah. Which like you say, should be actually quite, yeah, really fishy for people kind of looking on because as, you know, a single woman and you're at that point in your life where, you, you know, apparently you don't have any um, interests from, you know, 
from from men and you've got no kind of marriage proposal so what do you do you need to go be a governess and that's sort of what i think the idea was in the first place of going to stay with the campbells i think they were trying to like educate her to be able to do that so the fact she's saying no and she'd rather stay with miss bates who is obviously the kind of village sort of spinster and that people look kindly on and she's kind of this house of charity everyone's you know you should kind of think why would you want to stay in that position where your your livelihood depends on the goodwill of other people um so yeah that is such a, a major clue in terms of why why aren't you moving on yeah i think so and then um following on from this we get um this is actually one of my favorite i don't know why it's one of my favorite parts of emma is the the weird post office scene um i think it's because part of me just really loves i really love um john knightley he's just such a weird character but um the fact that he bumps into jane like first thing in the morning yeah i can't he is like mr palmer that's so true yeah he is it's this dry sort of yeah they're like the same person yeah 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 it's probably quite a similar character no you're completely right no absolutely and obviously he's walking first thing in the morning it's absolutely slatting it down with rain and he bumps into jane fairfax and he's like you know what are you doing out in the rain first thing in the morning um and then there's this whole that becomes a massive conversation like everything in highbury does of why jane is going like out first thing in the morning to collect her post or post letters um in everybody wants a bit of this conversation yeah it's so funny i think i get why you say it's one of like your favorite bits because when you're reading it you're kind of the more you're reading it the more you're getting stressed out on jane's behalf because like like especially when you realize why she's doing it because obviously she's doing it because she's you know she must be writing to frank and so she has to hide this from everyone and it's really funny because especially um mrs elton she just kind of keeps pressing her and pressing her and you're like oh gosh just leave her alone <laughs> um it's you almost, yeah you actually do start to feel like re- really bad for her and everyone like, so everyone just wants a piece of it and it's just actually quite funny to to read what yeah exactly what i like about this as well is i feel like this is one of the moments where jane isn't fully reserved either like she's she actually confirms that the letters are a friendship um which obviously is enough to make everybody be like oh who's the you know what friendship is this but she's also like you know i want to it's obviously clear that whatever this letter of friendship's about she doesn't want other people reading them or taking them and obviously because if somebody took the envelope it'd say frank church on and everyone would be like what is this um but yeah it's just interesting and i think you made a point in one of our other episodes where you were like the importance of like people used to read letters like it was a bit of a, a declaration or a show like you'd read letters aloud so it's interesting that she's so secretive about her letter writing yes especially when you've got the contrast of miss bates who literally reads out every single letter she receives um you know from jane or whoever and it's and there yeah so it, there is that contrast of character there where you've got someone so open and doesn't stop talking um and then another person living in the same house who is completely reserved doesn't talk about kind of her private life or what she's doing what she's been doing so that is really interesting as well to to have that contrast of characters almost living right next to each other i love in the um 2009 version as well there's like a moment where jane comes back first thing in the morning with her letter and miss bates is like oh who's that from and she's like oh it's from the campbells and they're like she's like oh i'd love to read it and she's like no maybe later and walks off with the letter but i think that's like such a good ad to show like that this is she just (laughs) miss bates like the worst person that could possibly get hold of the letter yeah yeah definitely yeah so she's having to live in this household which yeah it's just completely not ideal for her as well but she's got nowhere nowhere else to go so yeah that's it's su- such an interesting scene such a good scene and like you say so many points to take from that just the whole idea of what the letter means as well to people at that time so um so another part with that letter as well something that we find out later on is um we find out literally a couple of lines later that mrs weston got a letter from frank saying that he was going to be returning soon and when somebody asked jane if the contents of the letter was positive she says yes like it's really great it's good news um and so i think you can kind of align the fact that he's told jane that he's coming back because it's not so long later that mrs weston says i got i think mr weston turns up with a letter and he's read it even though it's mrs weston's letter yes. it says frank's yes. returning <laughs> yeah i don't remember because didn't mrs elton like call him out on it or something <laughs> he's like why are you uh, reading uh, someone else's letters <laughs> that, that's a good point i i hadn't noticed that actually yeah this time the fact that those letters are also received pretty close to each other it's just yes again such a clever subtle clue 
um, yeah, really, really good. Absolutely. Um, do you want to move on to when Frank then kind of returns? Um, because I feel like at this point we start to get a lot of events come in in quick concession. Yeah. yeah, so we have a few events that kind of happen, yeah, one after the other, where things do start to to build, don't they? Especially in um, in their relationship. And I think by this point there are a few kind of hints where I think you probably could cotton on to that things are happening. So Frank arrives back and um he kind of calls on emma first of all he's really agitated and he hurries away to make another call in highbury he's really restless um so he and he doesn't see emma i think for a while he sort of goes to see her and then runs away straight away um into highbury from that we can sort of say that he's obviously gone to maybe patch things up with with jane if something's happening they just have to go away um, and then you have the ball that actually takes place. And one thing, well, there's a couple of things that kind of was stood out for me about this. The first one is, I think, isn't there like a mix up with carriages in terms of who's going to be picking up the Bateses and Miss Fairfax? And I think the Eltons ended up sending one, but Frank was supposed to be providing for them. And he sort of... Yeah. Yeah, and he's like so agitated. There's actually yes. a line that says Frank Churchill he's seems to be on the watch. Agitated. Yeah, <laughs> he's like he's like hovering by the door. He's like really intense. Like, and yeah. Emma's like, why is he so like agitated Ag about like yeah. everybody being here? Yeah, and they arrive, and he just sort of goes, Miss Bates must not be forgotten, and just rushes off <laughs> to go and assist them. And I, this is another moment that I really love because I really think it's really telling. Um, and it says that. This is Emma's perspective. She saw Frank Churchill looking intently across the room at Miss Fairfax, who was sitting exactly opposite. Um, and there's a couple more lines I'd probably just like bring in on that one because I think it's really interesting. And he says, you know, thank you for alerting me that I was staring at Jane, basically. And he's and then he he does this thing that he does a lot where he'll be caught doing something nice and then he has to like account for it and he's like oh, I've, it's Jane's hair. It's such an unusual style. I've never seen anything so crazy. It must be of her own doing. <laughs> like she must be, which obviously it would be of her own doing. She doesn't have servants. <laughs> so, um, and he's like, he says, he uses a French term. I can't remember what the term is, but it basically means that it was really over-exaggerated. The curls were. And I think he's been caught staring at her, obviously, because he's in love with her. But then he has to say something so nasty, like in response. He could have just been like, oh, I was just admiring her hair. It's, you know a different style like you know it looks different than what everyone else has got you didn't have to be so mean about it yeah or even just something like oh, i was just lost in my thoughts i wasn't even looking at her she was just kind of there like even just not even anything to do with her but he's so brutal isn't he when he he tries to to say yeah say why he was doing something or why he was caught doing something and it's just yeah it's really harsh and not very nice so you don't wonder why emma gets to pick up on this and sort of says more than she ought to really especially to someone yeah. especially at the start when she doesn't even really know him that well and she's kind of allowed and given the space to just sort of yeah not say very nice things about someone when she is actually supposed to be the person that everyone looks up to to keep everyone you know kind of civil and amiable and she's the one that sets the tone of of the, of the situation so it's not uh yeah, it's not, yeah. I think the t the word she's there is tone is such a good point. Like maybe the fact that he's so mean is just a reflection because he's like, I'm speaking to Emma and Emma doesn't like Jane. So I need to say something mean because that's like how we are. Yeah. Um, and it's really weird as well because he says to Emma, he's like, I'm going to go and ask her if it's an Irish style. And he goes up and he's like, watch to see if she blushes. Yes. But then Emma makes a point of noting that he stands in front of Jane so she's like I couldn't even notice if I wanted to because you've yeah. just stood right in front of her like it's so funny that Emma makes that note and she's just like well, I so couldn't even see what her reaction is well, yeah yeah it's, I know it's really awful. such a good point he's yeah really clever in such a I don't know you kind of think oh it's really clever because he's doing his best to shield them and protect them but he also does it like you say in such a horrible way and it's this constant conflict of yeah, I get it. Being nice good. and then being mean. Horrible guy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's immaturity. I feel like that's the only way to show it because I don't think he's like super, like, I don't know. He's, I don't see him as like a full on villain, like somebody like Wickham or even Willoughby who, you know, leaves a lot of destruction in his wake. But I feel like Frank is just super immature and maybe a bit 
entitled and so behaves in a way that's just you know completely insane i mean and i also i'm not a massive advocate for jane fairfax either because i per the way i see it is she's accepted this situation because as we see from Miss Taylor, later Mrs. Weston, you can have a really successful life as a governess, okay? Her, her plan B is not bad. This isn't a bad situation. Um, and I personally would take her plan B over being disrespected by Frank constantly. I, I read an article in, um, although I didn't agree with a lot of the, the comments, it was by someone called um, Linda Hall. She made a note saying, Jane and Frank's secret engagement and correspondence diminishes Jane's self-worth. Yeah, yeah, I completely understand that. And there is this, thing of like her voice has been completely repressed and as you say we get these little bursts of it like the post office situation where she tries to sort of stand up for herself a bit and she just tries to stand up for herself with mrs elton when she's trying to press um you know the situation of governess that she can provide for her but at the same time like i actually do have a bit of sympathy for her because i actually think that whilst yes yeah, she could do a lot better at standing up for herself her position is actually, it's actually quite a precarious one because she has, so throughout her life, she's had no family. She's been obviously brought up by this other family and it's only through their goodwill that she's been able to have a really comfortable life. And then this guy comes along and she obviously falls in love with, um, but then he does sort of trap her into this secret engagement. And it's how do you get out of that? You're so close to this glimpse of being able to be a woman of having your own home, your own place to manage, of you know having a standing in society. Because Frank is, you know, he's he's been adopted by a wealthy family. He's from a good family in terms of the Western. So being able to just have that glimpse of hope and being able to, I could have this kind of life. I could have a position where I'm respected over being a governess, and again, kind of earning your keep and your life through the goodwill of others because you're relying on being placed with a good family and having a good income and also them treating you right and not having to rely on other people for your happiness and her being able to go and forge her own way with this person who she loves and like I say just have her own home and be comfortable and be safe and be provided for without having to feel like it could be all taken away from you at any moment and so you kind of understand why she goes along with it in that respect because when you have that glimpse of happiness, you do kind of hold on to that hope. And also as a woman, she wouldn't have been able to have much say. I mean, imagine like kind of coming out of that. If anyone did find out about the engagement after, after she'd said, after she'd broken it up herself. I think I mentioned before, maybe in a podcast with, with like, I think it was about Edward Ferris and how he had to break the engagement up because as a woman, that would have been really bad for your standing and your reputation but although this was secret again if anyone did find out then she would probably have been looked upon as not being great because she's already broken up one engagement so it doesn't look good for her um if it did it gets out. but she benefits from it being a secret already you know what i mean it's like already secret so she can end it herself yeah. but then i'm also like why didn't she just go to ireland then like she could have gone to ireland staying with the campbells the campbells didn't yeah. push her out they were like come with us and no. she could have met somebody else like i don't know i couldn't sacrifice yeah. but love finds you doesn't it i guess in that respect <sighs> so it must have done for her and she must have seen this life that she could have had and for her it was enough to take the risk so, and the fact that she's taking that risk is actually quite a big deal as well. So I get it from both sides because I don't think she stands up enough for herself, but I also see that she sees a chance of, of happiness that she tries to kind of take hold of, but it does turn toxic as well. So, so I saw, um, I was reading a, a Reddit post and people were talking about this because somebody asked like, why is it such a big deal um, that it's a secret? Um, or that they're even engaged or anything. Apparently the, the reason it's such a big deal is it, if it being secretive is because engagements were between families, not just couples. And so it's um, to keep it a secret from your family kind of puts them in shame that they've, this is like, you know, something they've not been open about. Um, so I thought that's really interesting. And I think maybe speaks to the fact that neither of them are very placed within their families. Like they've both got these like adoptive families and um, I feel like they don't have the same regard is like someone like Emma would have where you know her and Mr Knightley have to like conjure up a scheme on how they're going to tell Mr Woodhouse it's um a good point about the fact that they're both from like adopted families as well technically even though it is slightly different I'd never thought about that sort of similarity before so that's yeah that's so true and obviously the fact that yeah he's from quite he's adopted into quite a wealthy family means it would become such a big deal 
I think it ends the ball where he's sort of, what is he doing? He helps the Bateses kind of out of the ball. You get this monologue from Miss Bates and in the little monologue, you kind of hear her saying thank you to Frank Churchill and oh gosh, you've got Jane on one arm and me on the other and oh, all we talk about at home is Frank Churchill, which I just think is interesting anyway. And then you've got this little bit after the ball before they go to Box Hill and Donwell where Knightley begins to suspect what's happening so he begins to notice these looks that are happening between them and there's this again it goes back to this clue of a different letter where um i think frank brings up this thing about mr, mr. Perry. Perry. yeah the doctor saying oh wasn't he gonna um is it something to do with his carriage or something like that and he's like oh i'm sure you told me this is weston in one of your letters and she says no i don't know what you're talking about like it wasn't me maybe i did and he's there like oh well, all I think about is Highbury when I'm away, so maybe I'm just dreaming it. And then... Miss yeah, Bates, I love that he's like, I think it, maybe yeah, it's a dream, it's, I don't know. Like, 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 what kind of <laughs> weird dreams? If that's all you're dreaming about, like you're dreaming about Mr. Perry, I think they kind of say how weird that is. And then Miss Bates puts her foot in it and kind of goes, oh, Jane, don't you remember Grandmama's telling us of it when we got home that time? In Mrs. Bates, when she's explaining about it, like she actually is very clear and she says, I don't know how like you would have heard about it because it's quite a secret or, and she says like, you know, um, nobody but us and the Coles knew about it. Like we didn't tell a soul. Um, and so it's a bit like, well, how would he no, know? And he's like, oh, it's my dreams. Like, like he's <laughs> some sort of psychic. <laughs> really funny um yeah so which shows again the fact that it's linked to being told to him in a letter not just in person potentially kind of links back to that whole scene with you know jane fairfax's secret letters that she was sending um, but anyway yeah so you have that and mr knightley notices he kind of watches this whole conversation and then he notices frank churchill trying to catch jane's eye afterwards um like constantly but she doesn't she doesn't give it to him um and they go into the house at Hartfield and um they you know Frank suggests playing with like alphabet letters is yeah, it alphabet squares or yeah. something yeah <laughs> I never played this game myself but <laughs> it's clearly some of them the sort of regency game that kids used to play at the time and it makes me think about like on my fridge I have like letters and like we like make words and sentences out of them <laughs> like, yeah yeah it's obviously it's like a game the, the precursor to scrabble or something I don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> the version of Scrabble. Um, and they're playing with the letters I think and the word blunder is put on the table isn't it and that's Frank putting that towards towards Jane so you know the word was blunder there was a blush on Jane's cheek um, Mr Knightley connected it with the dream <laughs> and <all laughs> like he did about so letters. prophetic himself yeah <laughs> They're like I've got it and all Knightley could think about basically was the fact that there's this disingenuous double dealing which seemed to meet him at every turn um, and at this point Knightley is actually worried about Emma because he thinks that there's something going on between Frank and Jane Fairfax and he's worried about the fact that Emma has been kind of yeah there's this double dealing been going on and he starts to realize that Frank has been using her um, so yeah you have that thing about blunder and then you got the next word put forward um, Emma and Frank are kind of giggling together and they put forward the letters Dixon um, and Jane, she kind of, yeah, she was evidently displeased, looked up and seeing herself watched, blushed more deeply than he could ever have perceived it. So, yeah. Okay, this is something I really want to talk about because we know that Emma and Frank have been like speculating about her and Mr. Dixon, but they've never said that to you, Jane, in person. So I wonder whether Frank said, oh, it's so funny. Emma thinks that you've got something going on with Mr. Dixon. I'm just going to play on that. Like he's wrote that in a letter to Jane and they've talked about it. And so she's so upset because she's like, stop like having these inside jokes with Emma about me. It's like not funny because I'm like, otherwise, why would it be so offensive to her? Yeah, exactly. It's almost, and let them, they might have had a conversation before, you know, we can imagine all sorts of conversations they might or could have had. And, you know, she could have said to him, yeah, you need to stop bringing that up because it's really embarrassing. And the fact that they just did that so publicly and everyone as well kind of knows the story of the fact that she was with the Campbells and her friend obviously married Mr. Dixon. And if, you know, other people can start to get ideas as well, it's not just Emma and Frank and that's not fair on Jane the way i see it as well it's worse than exposing a secret engagement like trying to pretend like she had something going on with like 
a guy who was engaged to, you know, one of her closest friends. Yeah. <laughs> I just think it's so rude. And also it's so embarrassing because Harriet's like, can Mr. Knightley help me figure out what the words say? And it's like, you know, you know, these two kind of things going on. You just got Harriet sat there like, someone help me. <laughs> but it is, but, um, it's yeah. so embarrassing. It is, it is really embarrassing, but also kind of shows like there's just so how, I don't know, just how good this book is and how timeless it is. There's all these things going into it, you know, all this kind of, yeah. The layers, yeah. narrative, like it's the kind of thing that you would still read about today, so, you know. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think you're so right. It's like at this moment where Mr. Knightley, this is when he, he, set, he takes Emma aside and he says to her like, I, I've noticed these expressive looks, you know, I'm things that I'm, I'm think are meant to be public. Um, and I love in the 2009 version, they say secretive looks. They're like, I see some secret looks. And then Emma's like, secret looks? Like what? <laughs> what is this? This is so weird. And he's like, do you really understand the degree of acquaintance between the gentleman and lady that you share this joke with? Um, and I think like you said, like he's looking out for Emma because he's like, you think Jane's the butt of the joke, but I'm concerned you are um and he's right he actually is that's really interesting as well yeah so they're focusing on on jane fairfax being the joke but from his perspective he can now see that actually emma is becoming the joke and he's trying to work out you know is jane fairfax part of this or not in terms of the kind of yeah the jokes themselves are they doing it together or is it kind of just frank doing that but yeah that's a really interesting point as well yeah i think it's um it's interesting. And I feel like at this point, um, obviously he upsets Jane there, but this is a pan that's about to start boiling over because I yeah. think he gets so um, reckless in the in like what he's doing towards Jane. Like the letter's the first instance. And I think because he seems to be able to wash that off, he becomes more reckless as like his behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we move on to... Um, I think that the next thing is, is, is a Box Hill the next no, it's, moment? It's, they have a visit to Donwell. I think the idea, of, the idea of Box Hill is put forward and I think they end up going to Donwell first because they can't go to Box Hill. But And they I, have the on, argument. Yeah, so on both these scenes, I kind of take them both as it's beginning to kind of get to the climax of their sort of relationship and what is really clever about both these events is you do really begin to feel the growing tension and anxiety now beginning to realize that there's something going on between um, Jane and Frank and also what's really interesting is that this is now happening in the summer and the kind of heat and the atmosphere of it is used to make it more tense like when you're reading these scenes you yourself feel kind of like hot and stressed because they're both happening on like really hot summer days and it helps kind of build the agitation and um the yeah and i think everyone in the group is starting to feel kind of hot. everyone's in, in hot water and <laughs> bothered and it does kind of reflect then how like jane and frank are feeling too so you've got this really tense hot bubbling atmosphere like you say um and this kind of happens through donwell yeah i love the the, the Donwell strawberry picking thing. I, I love this moment because I think it's it's one where Jane's really vulnerable to Emma, yes. but Emma doesn't quite see why. Like she can't place what's going on, but Jane is, um, I mean, I'll let you you um, pull some bits from this, but yeah, this moment where Jane's just really vulnerable and she's basically asking for help. I, I think she's like crying out for help, but she knows nobody can help her. Yeah, completely agree. And I think it's one of the most interesting scenes for me actually. So you first, they arrive at, at Donwell um, and everyone's kind of yeah, doing their thing and what have you, but it gets to the point where Jane decides to seek Emma out um, to say that she's she's leaving. And Emma's like, you know, why are you leaving? Don't be walking back on your own. It's, it's hot and it's a 20 minute walk. Should we be doing that? Um, but she kind of responds to her and just goes, I am fatigued, but it is not the sort of fatigue, um, you know, quick walking will refresh me. Miss Woodhouse, we all know at times what it is to be wearied in spirits. Mine, I confess, are exhausted. And I just think like that's such, like you say, a, a cry for help and so upsetting as well. And Emma's trying to work out, yeah, why she suddenly said this to me. And she leaves and then you have Frank arriving pretty much soon after. And he's really hot and agitated. 
it and it's just really stressful to read and it's like you know the heat was excessive he'd never experienced anything like it and he goes you know talking about the parties about like, why is everyone wandering around i met one as i came madness in such weather madness and he's just kind of talking about how he's like he's sick of england he wants to go away and go abroad like, i'm gonna yeah, go abroad, go abroad <laughs> just to get all my problems like, don't we all <laughs> and um yeah so he's met obviously jane on the way and what has actually happened is they've you know they've had a, an argument and he's clearly frustrated with jane in this yeah in this at this point I think I, what we what we can surmise from the letter later on is that at this point Jane just says like that's it I've had enough like yeah. I can't take it anymore like it's too much for me. Um, in what I love in this moment is that Emma's like when she recognises like how agitated and angry is she's like thank God I'm not in love with him yes. because look he's a bit of a crazy person. <laughs> she's like oh she's like oh, I don't feel anything of him because I couldn't be able to deal with this um, and she just kind of like just just eat some food and he's like I don't want any food. <laughs> I know he's so he's so grumpy at this point, but then I think he I mean, just like Frank, he bounces back when she's saying, you know, we're all gonna go on this trip to Box Hill and he's like, Oh, okay, yeah, we'll do that and I think he wants Emma back on his good side because he uses Emma as this like person he can flirt with and well I think now he's like obviously I, I don't think he plans his revenge plot, but he's thinking, you know, well, if Jane's gonna not be with me then I'll do whatever I want. And what I kind of like about finally on this bit on Donwell as well, you've um, you've got quite a contrast between obviously Frank Churchill and then Mr Knightley, who is obviously the owner of Donwell, and he's very kind of calm and accommodating and sort of you know helping people and talking to Harriet and things like that. And I remember in a university seminar a while back we were actually talking about i used to love it when like we used to get to talk about jane austen <laughs> at uni and i remember my tutor kind of saying this whole idea we're talking about um this idea of propriety and facades and you know things kind of reflecting like jane austen's idea of what someone kind of good should look like and donwell abbey we're saying like even the name donwell is like done well like it's just it's this i it's this image of kind of perfection and calmness and it's how things should be and it reflects you know austin's opinion of how you know something should look how your facade should look and you've got this contrast between you know frank churchill who is hot and bothered and stressed and you've got mr knightley who is this calm gentleman of how you should act basically at this point that that was just kind of like a a little I sign. That. <laughs> no, no, I, I think I think names in Emma are really important. Like if you think about Hartfield and the fact that Emma is like obsessed with matchmaking people, yeah, I think names are super important. I don't think I, I, I don't think Jane Austen ever puts useless information out there. Like everything that she does is strategic. She does it for a reason. And um yeah, I, I think that's probably definitely the case. And I think all the way through, like Mr. Knightley's always saying like the way that Frank's behaving, even him not visiting his father, it's not proper. Like, it's not, this isn't gentleman behavior. Um, and yeah, I think, well, Mr. Knightley holds on to this for the whole of the the book. You know, he, he feels this way throughout. In fact, he, in the end, he's like, you know, I feel bad for Jane Fairfax. She could do much better. Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people actually feel like that as well. But yeah, we can discuss that at the end. But yeah, that's yeah, that's such an interesting point. Yes, I love looking into sort of the names and like I say, she never says anything without a reason, which is why these podcasts are so fun because we can get to chat about our, our ideas about them as well. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of all I had sort of on that scene before we move on to Box Hill. I don't know if you've had anything. anything else. No, I don't have anything else to add. I think moving on to Box Hill would be good because um at this point i think um obviously jane's already said that she's pretty much done but she's not ended the engagement but obviously the actions of box hill and frank just being an absolute douche is what kind of is the final nail in the coffin for her i think and yeah. obviously leads her to accept the governor's position yeah definitely so they go they go to box hill it's another trip that they take with everyone and um again it's a really hot stressful day Kind of again reflecting you know the weather reflecting everyone's feelings um and there's i think they've just sort of got there and it's really funny because emma sort of it, what's not her saying it but it's from her kind of perspective and austin kind of writes at first it was downright dullness to emma she had never seen frank churchill so stupid and silent <laughs> <laughs> 
something's <laughs> clearly up here. Um, and it's just the whole thing just really awkward. I I do actually quite like it in the the 2020 film version because they're all sort of sat. It just it, you, for me, I can you can really feel that tension when they're all sat there. They kind of do it well in all the versions, really, but. Everyone's sort of sat there in silence, aren't they? Looking at each other. Looking at each other. They don't really know what to say. Like, Jane Fairfax is looking miserable at us. <laughs> um, then, yeah, like you say, Frank just kind of goes off on one, doesn't he? It's almost as if he's got nothing to lose. And he starts to sort of engage Emma in these sort of silly discussions and really embarrassing and awkward discussions. So... Again, really immature the topics as well, where he's like, oh, you could pick a wife for me, Emma. Like, yes, I know it's like yeah. anyone that you choose. Yeah, so they're kind of <laughs> whispering and then he's like shouting as well and they're doing that together. And he sort of says, you know, our companions are excessively stupid. What should we do to arouse them? Um, they managed to insult Miss Bates. They play this silly kind of conundrum game. Oh, and then, There's a weird moment as well yeah. where he says about Mr. and Mrs. Elton's attachment and it's like, oh, how lucky they were to find each other and such a small attachment in a public place or yes. something like that. Yes. And I think that's so interesting because he's basically yes. talking about his and Jane's, how they met. Yes. And then she actually responds and he, so he kind of said, he says, how many a man has committed himself on a short acquaintance and rued it for the rest of his life? And um, Miss Fairfax, she then kind of responds. She starts to talk and then kind of gets interrupted by a cough. But then she kind of, she carries on stronger and she sort of ends with saying, you know, such unfortunate circumstances do sometimes occur both to men and women. Um, but I cannot imagine them to be very frequent. And he sort of kind of bows and that's it parts. And it's just like, oh, something's been said in this exchange. There's a lot more to it than that as well. But I don't, I don't know if you had anything on that as well. But um, yeah. I just love that she responds because honestly, I mean, nothing irritates me more than some of the characters where they're like really passive and don't, don't fight back. It really irritates me. Um, but I love that Jane at this moment, she's like, you know what no like don't but also don't belittle what we had either okay it's one thing being like say if this isn't going to work out any further but don't belittle what we had and start being cruel about it or saying that people that make attachments and short acquaintances there's something wrong with them or their relationship it's like this is between us um and let's respect what we had even if it's not going to go any further yeah and you know they've obviously probably had those conversations in the past where he might have reassured her about that and now he's saying you know something like this again it's all fictional in my head at this point but you know we can kind of imagine what went on and then what i find really awkward is the timing because you said a moment ago when he says to emma to choose him a wife and he asks her to do that straight after this conversation he's had with jane like how mean is that <laughs> like he's just had this conversation with jane and kind of just sort of like left it and then he's like oh emma find me a wife um but yeah which is so rude and immature. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? Like, who says something like that? Like, that's like so childish. Like, it's something that you do in high school where you just be like, why don't you find me a partner? Like, who do you think would be best? I just, oh, it blows my mind sometimes, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, when you, the, the, the timing of these things happening is just, again, really clever writing on, on Jane Austen's part, but also really infuriating when you're following the characters because, and it does, yeah, it kind of shows what person he is. Um, but yeah, everyone, they sort of disperse, don't they, after everyone's upset each other and they sort of walk off and the day ends in Emma's tears and, um, yeah, I don't know if you had anything else to, to add. Um, not really. I mean, I think everybody, everybody goes and obviously, um, I think the fact that they upset Miss Bates is just another added thing on Jane's heart because she's just like, and also... I kind of feel bad for Emma because Emma doesn't know what's going on. Like, she doesn't know that they've got an attachment. And obviously when she finds out later, she's like, oh my gosh, how embarrassing because of my behaviour. Um, but Jane naturally is is obviously annoyed at both of them. And I also think that the reason she doesn't want to be around Emma is because she's not so much annoyed that Emma said the mean things to Miss Bates. I think it's because she thinks that there's something going on with Frank. And why would you want to be around somebody that you is potentially a threat to you, who's in a much better position to, to you? Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you're going to compare Jane and, and Emma in terms of, you know, who's the better catch, Emma on paper is the better catch. And so, um, yeah, I think she's just like, you, you wouldn't want to be, the same way as Emma doesn't like to be compared to Jane Fairfax, I'm sure Jane Fairfax doesn't want to be compared to Emma. Yeah, yeah. Because they both you, lack what the other has. Yeah, you can't help in that situation but feel jealous or just yeah 
just not wanting him to be around that person you know especially when you can't act you know freely with frank churchill and you see someone else sort of having a laugh and a joke and being able to chat to him and no one thinks anything of it because em is in that mm-hmm. position where like you say she's the sort of the social butterfly of high isn't she? she's able to go and speak to whoever she wants to wherever she wants and even if there is no attachment between frank and emma it's not even that weird that they're talking or having a bit of a laugh i mean everyone does start to think that there should be something between them and like you say Knightley's worried about her falling in love and obviously the westerns want that to happen but it would be upsetting for jane to watch them being able to talk freely and actually court openly even if they're not courting and that's something that she wasn't able to do she wasn't able to enjoy that bit before being able to yeah court him and have people kind of look on them and be like oh isn't it wonderful that they're together she'll never have that yeah. she, ne- she never got that and um yeah the day sort of ends and then i think jane jane avoids emma for the rest yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> well, well, for like forever jane just then avoids emma for the the rest yeah and so Emma visits the Bateses, I think, to sort of make amends of, to what happened because, you know, Knightley has words with her and things like that. She realises where she's kind of gone wrong. Um, she goes to visit them often, but Jane is always unwell and um, she has decided to, to actually take up the position of governess, you know, nearby Maple Grove. <laughs> Maple Grove. We Maple all know Grove. about Maple Grove. Um, but we find out what's interesting is the timing of that as well. So we find out that Frank has left for Richmond again, which is where his family is staying before tea. And after tea, Jane confirmed she would be governess. So it's yeah, like absolutely. he's gone. Like you said, it's that thing of no matter what, his family has obviously still come first over Jane. And because she's been like, right, at this point, you probably needed to step up for me. He didn't do it. He left. They haven't sorted out their differences. So she's just gone off on her own and been like, you know what, I'm just going to be a governess, basically. I don't know if I'm making this up, but I feel like he received, they, it says that he receives a letter and everybody like assumes it's something to do with Mrs. Churchill. Yeah. But then we also get confirmation from Miss Bates that Jane's been writing letters all morning and she's been crying. And she's like, I don't know why she's crying. She should be yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. So again, she's probably 100% been like, no not having it anymore and yeah so she's um so then she doesn't see anyone she won't see emma and then doesn't emma go off to she just called to see if she's all right like to, to to go call on her and they said oh jane's unwell and she walks back and she like sees she sees jane just like running around a meadow, around the meadow yeah <laughs> she's just she's just on a daily she's like oh my gosh she's she's actually on a walk i love that i think that's so funny and emma's just like okay i need to take the hint that this is a personal thing this isn't, yeah, yeah this isn't okay. she's unwell this is she doesn't want to see me yeah and i think she she understands but from a different perspective because she knows she's maybe not given the attention that um jane fairfax could have maybe got from her um yeah she could have maybe been more of a friend but judgment kind of clouds and jealousy's kind of cloud and the whole situation they're both maybe suffering in a different way they've both been hurt in a different way not necessarily emma but she's been played yeah yeah Yeah. and you can't just expect people to be friends just because they're of the same like the same age or you know what it's just not that's not really how it works yeah like she has a genuine point with that to be fair you can't force a friendship just because you're the same age Exactly. Emma chooses her friends to the ones that she, you know, she, she'd rather be friends with Harriet. So I don't think it's, I don't think Emma's necessarily saying like, oh, I don't want to be friends with Jane Fairfax because I'm above Jane Fairfax. She, Emma is friends with Harriet, who for all intents and purposes is in a similar situation to Jane Fairfax. She just probably just doesn't want to be a friend. She's probably sick of hearing about it. Why would you want to spend time with someone that you spent your entire life hearing like just praise about constantly how how accomplished they are like you just feel like oh my god i don't want like it's enough to hear about it i don't want to see every day yeah yeah, exactly so yeah i kind of yeah i read that but yeah so it ends in that and then yeah we sort of get the mrs churchill dies yes (laughs) i love the 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 point that austin makes she's like everybody's talked ill of mrs churchill for the entire novel but now she was like and now everybody's being positive about it because she's dead (laughs) yeah these little funny funny lines that come out there it's like there's it in um, sense of sensibility where someone says oh there's everyone like when there's an, an annuity to be paid to someone, they live forever or something like that. Kind of, <laughs> Fanny like, says that wait, ever, people live forever when there's an annuity to be yeah, paid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's 
that's so funny. funny yeah i love these little like comments yeah. on society yeah. it's brilliant um but then this is pretty much it i mean i don't want to spend too much time on the, the revelation just because we all know what the revelation is that obviously they're engaged and in talking through it we've talked a lot about like what was what's explained as being the case like looking back um but I think what everybody's a little bit like disturbed about is that obviously Jane's now I don't know if you know this but I'm always confused of why it's such a it's such a big deal that Jane's accepted the position and then obviously can't take it anymore like why is that such is that it's just like a um I don't know like a a morals thing because she signed a contract I'm not sure like for me I'm just like I don't know why everybody gets so hot on the fact that it's like oh my gosh she signed this thing and now she can't do it anymore like I, i'm kind of confused why that's such a big deal like they can just find yeah. another governess but yeah, something I've, I've not thought about i mean i don't know whether it's because obviously it was sort of mrs elton that got it for her and so she's gone out of her way to use her connections and get this good position for her so it could be to do with that so because someone else is involved if that makes sense and yeah I think uh, and I think Frank goes and finds Jane somewhere like I don't know for sure I can't really remember but I think he goes and like finds her somewhere and it all comes out and uh Frank's like traveling around all over the place and now he doesn't need Mrs Churchill's permission he just goes and asks Mr Churchill because he's apparently like a really soft kind guy and he was, he's just like yeah he'll say yes um and Frank's like traveling all around the country because they were in like North Yorkshire and now yeah. they're somewhere else it's all like just a bit weird like frank's just trying to tie up all his loose ends <laughs> <laughs> just imagine him just riding around the british country <laughs> trying to sort everything <laughs> and then he tells the westerns that he's obviously engaged to jane fairfax and um it all just kind of comes out but um, yeah. i don't know if you want to add anything particular about so, it all coming out i think emma is called to go and see mrs western and they're all they're like oh come in come in and Mr. Weston's like, oh, go on, I'll leave you to it, sort of thing. And it's really, they're really sort of um, upset about it and agitated because at this point they are upset because they think that Emma has formed an attachment to Frank Churchill. So they are worried that she's going to be really upset when, um, when she hears about it. Because obviously, as much as Frank is his son, I think Emma is almost like a sort of second daughter to them as well. Um, so Mrs. Weston tells Emma, or us really, of Frank and Jane's engagement. And um, she says there's been a solemn engagement between them since October formed at Weymouth. <laughs> and yeah, so then Emma convinces her that, you know, she, there was, there's no love lost between them. You know, she didn't have that attachment and they're really relieved. And they kind of talk about then how sort of, how bad it was to, you know, for, for Jane to have to deal with it. Because, you know, Emma talks about how she would have had to have witnessed all of what's happened. She starts to reflect, obviously, her part on it. And I really like this this quote that Emma says actually because I think it's it's pretty kind of you know you want to be like yeah yes Emma like, you, you say it how it is kind of thing and she goes you know what right had he to endeavour to please as he certainly did to um... well, hang on I can't even what did I write there <laughs> my handwriting is awful <laughs> what does that say hang on I have to find the book. <laughs> No, no, that's fine. No, no, yeah, for sure. No, you look for it. That's okay. I'm just, there's a quote I want to find out as well where, where um, they talk about this. Right, here it is. Got it. Okay. So, um, yeah, Emma says this quote, which I think is, is pretty cool. And she sort of goes, what right had he to endeavour to please, as he certainly did, to distinguish to distinguish any one young woman with, with preserving attention as he certainly did while he really belonged to another, which I think is really strong. You know, the fact that he Ruth. sits there and she goes, you know, what right had he to do this? What right had he to mess with one person whilst clearly, yeah, kind of Yeah, and I think Frank else, tries to... To someone else. Yeah. I think Frank tries to justify it later where he's like, I would never have done it if I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure that Miss Woodhouse was just being flirtatious and playful as well. Like if I knew that she was attached to me, I wouldn't have done it. But I'm like, that's still a risky game. That's still a risky, risky game, game to play. Yeah, yeah. And it's something like, I think a lot of people would probably like feel today, you know, when you hear of these, you know, really awful situations where it happens, you're like, what right had that person to mess around with someone else when you are, you know, committed to someone else? It's, it's, yeah, and she kind of, 
stands up for herself and Jane in that sentence, which I really like because she's actually kind of put them together in the sense that, you know, she can see that Jane suffered and also she's been a part of this as well. And she's kind of said, how, how dare he kind of use me? What right had he to mm. mess around with me and Jane Fairfax? And, you know, and how could she bear such behaviour? Yes. And um, I think Jane herself, like, says later on that she's, you know, went against everything in her character to do this, to be secretive. And there's a line that said the misery of what she had suffered during the concealment of so many months. So she's she's suffering and she's miserable. I mean, this is why, obviously, part of me is like, I don't really understand why you'd even do it. But um, she loves Frank enough to go against her character and conceal and be secretive about all of this. And I mean... He's asked a lot of her and he was awful to her. I mean, it, I think that's probably why everybody's so amazed in the end that they end up together because it's like, what, <laughs> what, why? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think there's also this comment that Emma makes as well, where she kind of comments on sort of like women and their sort of their role and place at this point. And I think it's very interesting. And she sort of says, and she says feelingly, you know, if a woman can ever be excused for thinking only of herself, it is in a situation like Jane, Jane Fairfax's. Of such, one may almost say that the world is not theirs, nor the world's law. I think she's really realising, like, if there was ever a time for a woman to stand up for herself, it's then because it is really not fair to be you know, messed around by used. a man who, and used who should be actually there to take care of you. And, yeah. And actually, I mean, that's probably that's probably the thing. I probably take it from the stance of like I see it from the same position as Emma. As I'm like, I don't know why you'd ever let somebody yeah. treat you that way. Like you not just stand up and be like, I'm sorry, no. That's Any situation is better than this situation. I don't want to be disrespected. Yeah, yeah. It's like this is a moment. Uh, <laughs> life, <laughs> life lessons on the podcast. Yourself. Stand up. Do it's not take yourself. any of this rubbish. Yeah, you cannot rely on men. <laughs> No, it's not be independent. Like, <laughs> literally, no. I think, but I think she's got such a great point. Like, it's, I, yeah, I wouldn't be dealing with it. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, and that, I mean, that's pretty much everything at that point, isn't it? It's all wrapped up. They end up, you know, I think everybody's a little bit like maybe they're not going to have the happiest of marriages because you know she's got all the merit. I think someone said like she's got all the merits and he's got the, the money. Is basically yeah, the. Yeah. The situation, which is the greatest a... start, is it to married life, having to deal with all of that, and then suddenly, well, that crazy. You're married, and it's like, okay, you've just been living your life as a secret, and you're like, how do I transition from from that into normality now? What does our relationship even look like? Do we even know each other? And also, I know that you can lie really well. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it be like a a real intense gaslight to like, and, and just doing like weird stuff. I mean. Yeah, I mean, if he could do that when it was a secret and he knew that she was, like, suffering and he could do... I mean, God knows what he can do when it's all out in the open. I mean, I think Emma makes a point of saying, like, you need to treat her well because I think Emma's a little bit like, I don't think he's going to. <laughs> yeah, I think their marriage could quite quickly turn into a um, into a Bronte novel after being an Austin novel. <laughs> it's given me, like... Yeah. You know, well, 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 but, um, yeah, it's, it's such a complex situation and i'd say there's so many different sides to it in terms of you know should she have stood up for herself more or was she trapped in a position you know what was frank churchill's role in all of this what was going on in his life what was going on in jane's life there's so many different complexities and relationships within the whole situation which is why it just makes that narrative so interesting and it sort of yeah runs throughout sort of the middle towards the end of the book but it draws so many other people into their situation they try to keep this a secret and actually it's meant that everyone's got involved and a lot of people have got hurt and yeah it's just super interesting and just shows how how much can go on in a, in a little village in, in England <laughs> things just get a bit crazy you know all these secrets everything's getting entangled it's all a bit it's all a bit mental for yeah. sure um yeah, no, I think that was great though. I really enjoyed this. Anything else that you want to add on um, this or is that everything? I think we've come, we've come so much. This has been like so much fun. We were like, getting we've literally this. been like an hour and 50. <laughs> like we've, this is like the longest episode ever. <laughs> the longest episode ever. But yeah, I was so sorry if I, I rambled on, but this is, yeah, it's just, I just find it really, there's just so much stuff to find. And um, it was just pretty interesting as well, talking 
you know, to you about your thoughts, because I think, you know, you picked up on stuff that I hadn't even thought about and, you know, maybe vice versa. So it was just really interesting being able to discuss it and really go into their story and go into a story that's within a story, if that makes sense. Like, that's how complex it is. Yeah. You've got the story of Emma, but, I mean, you could probably write a book on, on Frank and, um, and Jane Fairfax's story, to be honest. So it is. Yeah, their, their story holds itself on its own, for sure. And I think... Um there's so many more clues than I ever realized. Like when I started looking through, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so, there's so many clues throughout and you just don't pick up on it because you're, you're kind of, you're, you're kind of told to look in other places. So you're constantly, your attention's shifted from it. Even if you for a moment would even consider it, you just, yeah. You, and also you're probably there thinking, why would a guy ever be this mean who was with someone? Like you wouldn't even think that together because you're like, why would he be so mean? I don't, I don't get it. But um, yeah, but I love that. You know, I really enjoyed talking it through. I thought it was really, it was super interesting. I love reading it from this perspective yeah. as well so that was really great yeah, me too it's really um, interesting reading her books from a certain perspective and also what's in you know emma i think is actually one of her not easiest to read but it does it is like not as complex to read maybe as the others and yet there's so much stuff in it so i just find that really really clever too just the fact that there's there's so many layers but it's actually like a really good read just all around too but yeah thank you that was really really good fun and um yeah, I hope everyone enjoys thinking about Jane and, and Frank Churchill's story a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to let people know where they can find you after the episode? Yes, so um, I am mainly on Instagram, so you can find me at historian underscore Ellis, um, E-double-L-I-S. And yeah, I post all sorts on there. Um, you know, a lot of Jane Austen stuff, a lot of kind of, of history stuff as well. So I'm a PhD student in history looking at 19th century women um and um, yeah there's kind of stuff on there that i just like reading or doing if you love countryside if you like going to bath yeah all sorts of stuff on there if you fancy it yeah absolutely i really recommend people um checking your page out for sure and of course as always i'll add it in the bio i'll also tag all of the other episodes that elle's been on with me because we've done quite a few now and obviously um we did the first villain off together with kaylee and hopefully you're going to be on with us yeah, again this I mean, I'm hoping the three lost. of us will yeah. like be there <laughs> yeah, I'm a few months. I don't know. it's yeah it's just been one of those one of those years i think but it's so much fun i honestly absolutely oh my gosh i know it's, it's so much fun it's just more like having conversation with yeah such a good friend so thank you no of course they always love chatting with you um that's everything from us today so um obviously you can find me as usual over on instagram at what the austin for any updates on the podcast and more jane austin content but that's everything from me today and i'll see you in another episode <laughs>